It's Monday, April 19th, 2021, and in today's video, I'm going to be answering some Cypher system related questions I've received right here on YouTube or on Twitter. This will be the first of a weekly series of videos, usually falling on a Monday or a Tuesday, where I'll focus in on some specific questions I've gotten from the greater Cypher system and Numenera community. If you'd like to have a question featured, all you have to do is drop a question in the comment section of this video, or flag me down on Twitter at infconstruct with the hashtag infinite Q&A so I can more easily sort them. This week's first question comes from Mark Croft over on Twitter. I have a question. Another way to give XP, I can't accommodate the MCG way. They clarified it a bit more, specifically by saying it was intrusions that they struggled with. They write, I work the old way. I never remember to give XP and generate an intrusion when it applied a problem. I'm looking for other ways to give experience points. So there are a few ways to address this. I would first very much recommend checking out my most recent video on GM and player intrusions as both I and Lucas Santana from Rule of Lore share a number of perspectives and thoughts on this mechanic. What's important to remember about intrusions and about the cipher system is that your players won't be earning XP for slaying monsters and just finishing quests. Instead, they earn XP by going through narrative experiences, either through GM intrusions or through discoveries in Numenera. XP emerges from narrative developments in this way, not just as the end result of players passing a difficult challenge. If you're already the kind of GM who fashions interesting narrative twists and changes spontaneously and in the heat of the moment, then you're halfway there. Just start reminding yourself that when you announce a sudden shift or a development in a scene, the character it's focused on earns XP for having this event occur. It's by going through one of these twists that a player earns an experience point. They're earning a point for the experience you're creating. If awarding it on the spot interrupts some of your flow as GM, consider using the rule variant mentioned on page 408 of the Cypher System rulebook, where you tally up the number of XP earned through intrusions and distribute it more evenly. With this variant, you'll want to focus on one to four intrusion-worthy moments that occurred during the game and assign two XP per intrusion. Make a note during the game of when you think something constitutes an intrusion and come back to that at the end of the session. You and your players can discuss how these points should be distributed then based on which characters played the most central roles during these changes that you introduced as the GM. This means that the mechanic of players being able to refuse intrusions on the spot during a game may fade away, but if managing XP in this way is a better fit for you and your group, by all means, go for it. If you still find the intrusion method a little clunky or abrasive to your techniques as a GM where it concerns XP distribution, I'm going to propose an alternative approach that some diehard Cypher System fans might consider a bit of heresy. In this very homebrew approach, I suggest tossing out all of the rules for earning and spending experience points from the rulebooks and instead splicing in the XP structure from the computer role-playing game Torment Tides of Numenera. I call this variation on XP distribution the cast-off method in reference to the game's plot. While the game adapts many cipher system mechanics to a video game medium, one of the things it changes up is XP distribution. Here, it costs 180 experience points to advance your character toward the next tier. You do this four times, so each tier is worth 720 points. With some back-of-the-napkin math here, this means that it takes 4,000 320 experience for a character to reach the highest tier. What we're aiming for here is a bit of a fusion between older techniques of character advancement with the task resolution structure of the cipher system. If you're not using GM intrusions to issue XP, then characters will need to find it elsewhere, and by not tying it to central narrative moments, you will likely benefit from distributing it on a wider scale, and possibly even considering awarding XP for traditional things like killing monsters and accomplishing quests. As I said, this is heresy for the cipher system. As a baseline, each creature can be worth their target number to hit in XP, and you can judge as the GM what discoveries or completed quests may be worth. With the cast-off method, you'll have more XP to play with for this, and you can award it in a way that is perhaps more familiar to you, as with 4,320 XP for a character's entire advancement, we're working with numbers that are a bit more familiar to something like Pathfinder, 
or that other medieval fantasy game. If the numbers are too large to deal with, you can always cut them in half, and if they're not enough, you can double or triple them. Where it concerns the purchase of things such as immediate, short, and long-term benefits as are illustrated on page 125 of Numenera Discovery, you can basically work with the following ratio. For everything that costs 1 XP in the cipher system as is written in the books, charge 45 XP using the cast-off method. This dramatically changes the nature of the cipher system, but from my perspective, if you're tearing out the intrusion mechanic as it pertains to XP distribution, you're already making a substantial change in how narrative development works particularly the narrative distribution of XP. My own perspective in balancing this out is to increase the amount of XP so that you can base awards on more traditional approaches, given that the intrusions mechanically aren't being used. You may come up with some balance issues, and you'll likely need to make your own personal tweaks to the numbers here and there, but using this approach is going to scaffold out character advancement in a way that's a lot more traditional, while still keeping the cipher system's task resolution mechanics in place. There will be a link to a blog post in the description of this video detailing the math for the cast-off method. For those who are more interested in a traditional XP and award structure in Cypher system, I may also consider doing a full video on this homebrew approach. Our last question for the week comes from YouTube, with Planet from Outer Space writing in, Here is the question I have as someone who's only GM'd one session of Numenera. Why can't my players roll d10s instead of d20s, requiring players to roll a 3 for a difficulty 3 challenge? The only problems I can see, other than the fact that a d10 is less satisfying to roll thanks to its shape, is that certain ciphers and abilities grant modifiers to a roll that is less than easing the roll, and that bonuses for rolling 17 and up would need to be tweaked to 9 and up. I think the modifier problem is the only potentially large one, but I can see that being adjusted on a case-by-case -case basis. First of all, I always recommend tweaking a system and radically replacing things like which dice are used to experiment and learn more about the system. If you feel like a d10 will work better for your experience and you're willing to do the homebrew math to balance it all out, by all means give it a try. But here I'll argue why I do think the d20 is the better choice for this game. Here's some interesting trivia that a bit of internet archaeology can unearth. It would seem that, based on a snippet of a blog post, Numenera may have ended up with a d10 as its main die, or at least that was possibly considered when the game was in its early creation phase. Monty Cook himself clarified his appreciation of the d20 on a blog post accessible via the Wayback Machine, and he literally refers to the physical nature of a d20, saying, Man, I like how that d20 rolls, and so do a lot of gamers. I don't think this is a trivial point. The way we physically interact with our games is quite important, and the ease of rolling a d20, I think, plays a pretty important role in why that die in particular is so popular with RPGs. A d20 is quick and easy to roll, and as Monty Cook points out in this archived blog post, there is also significant theater in seeing a 1 or a 20 come up. This is a part of our experience at the table, or even virtually, and I think the d20 has shown that its physical nature really keys well into the fun of the game, and that's not something to necessarily ignore. In the same post, Monty Cook also dives into some of the math and challenges for success and failure when it comes to using a 10-sided die versus a 20-sided one. I won't get too much into these statistics, but to answer your question most directly as to why a d20 is a better fit for the cipher system's 10 levels of difficulty instead of a d10 has a lot to do with levels 7 through 10, which are impossible to hit on a die 20 roll. This means that the characters will face challenges that sheer luck alone won't get them through. They'll need to have strengths in key areas or abilities or items they can use to lower the difficulty. With a d10, a character always has a chance of rolling a 9 or a 10 without needing any sort of specialization. By requiring a d20 and having four levels of difficulty require the numbers the die is not capable of, the task difficulty system can more fully represent the world. Some things are very easy, some things require a challenge, and at the end of that scale we find challenges that some might say are virtually impossible. In order to have the sense of the impossible and incredibly difficult challenges using a d10, we'd have to resort to dice pools where we tally multiple successes, as seen in World of Darkness, for example. These have their place, though they are often a little bit absurd with the amount of pools of d10s that can be rolled during a game. By having a central die, however, we can avoid the burden of multiple d10s while still having challenges that are impossible unless there's sufficient skill, training, favorable circumstances, 
or reality bending powers. Having just a single D10 measured against 10 levels of difficulty means that a tier 1 character by sheer luck alone could possibly damage a level 10 Dread Destroyer. This approach would dilute the most menacing of challenges in the game and would rob the players of using what they have at their disposal to lower the difficulty as complete luck could still guarantee a success in the most impossible of circumstances. This means that players will look at difficulty ratings like 7, 8, 9, or 10, which require an impossible 21, 24, 27, and 30 out of a d20, and will turn to their strengths to make that difficulty accomplishable, and it will make passing a level 7 through 10 challenge all the more impressive. So the d20 offers the cipher system a number of advantages over a d10. We have a task resolution system where some target numbers can't be hit on the main die, and so characters must pull from their strengths, talents, and powers to influence this instead of adding more dice to a pool. When you combine this with the physical nature of a 20-sided die and how great of a game item it is physically, I think the answer is pretty clear as to why using a D10 in Numenera would lead to an incredibly different and potentially less satisfying experience that would either cut off impossible feats or burden players with massive pools of D10s. Also, as you point out, with more numbers on the die, we can do more with rarer outcomes like assigning extra damage to rolls that land on a 17 or above, or unique and special effects from rolling a 19 or a 20. We get the ease of 10 levels of difficulty with opportunities for critical rolls and hits as we find in other games. I think it's worth going through the minor teething period of getting used to rolling a 20-sided die against 10 levels of difficulty to enjoy what this can offer for a game, especially in Numenera. And that about wraps up this week's Q&A. Please feel free to drop a question about Numenera or the Cypher system in the comments below or on Twitter if you'd like something answered in a future video. Until then, thank you for watching and please consider subscribing to The Infinite Construct for more Numenera and science fantasy content.